Welcome to Game Plunge, a series all about the analysis and discussion of game design. In this episode, we will be taking a look at the design behind the original Half-Life. Half-Life is considered to be one of the pioneers in the first-person shooter genre. It has won many awards and is by some people considered to be one of the greatest games of all time. But what made it so different from the rest of the games? What was so revolutionary in Half-Life that hadn't been done before? And, most importantly, why did so many people enjoy it this much? Let's try to find these answers by taking a look at the game and diving into the design behind it. The first five minutes of a game are arguably the most important. It is in this short time frame where the game must draw the player's attention and keep them interested in playing the game. So, what does Half-Life do in these vital first minutes? We start off with a very dull train ride without a lot of action. It is more of a sightseeing tour, if anything, where the developers show off the capabilities of the game. Now this does not seem to be the impressive and eventful first few minutes you'd expect. That is, because this train ride serves an entirely different purpose. First of all, the train serves as an area where the players can practice moving and looking around in a safe environment. There is no penalty for messing up yet, and you'll have plenty of time to get used to the controls. But there is a second reason the train ride is in the game. It is an element which serves to deliver one of the main aesthetics in the game. This train ride is simply a part of your character's daily routine. This is just a regular workday at this point. It's probably very relatable, which makes it easier to place yourself in this situation. This all enforces one aesthetic, the fantasy aesthetic. This is a huge part of Half-Life and we can find several methods the designers used to place you in Gordon Freeman's shoes. The designers wanted you to be immersed in the experience, instead of immediately placing you in the action. You have to be a part of the main character's daily routine. This immersion works perfectly with the first person perspective in the game, since you as a player look through the eyes of the protagonist. A common dynamic that we can find is the freedom the player is given. Instead of telling the player exactly where to go and what to do, the designers decided to leave it up to the player where to go. Notice that there is never an objective, never a marker or an arrow in the heads-up display to point where the player has to go. This mechanic makes for a more immersive experience, since you wouldn't have such markers in real life. Therefore, it enforces Half-Life's fantasy aesthetic. This lack of markers or objectives also has another purpose. It forces you to look around and search for where you have to go. Think for a moment what Half-Life would be like if you did have such pointers. You'd most likely just be walking towards the objective all the time, and Half-Life would suddenly turn into a repetitive rail shooter. But by purposely leaving out such pointers, the player is forced to walk around and explore the level to progress, or just to find some extra resources. The player has to discover his way through the game, instead of simply being told what to do. With this exploration, the player can find extra ammunition or health. But there is more to be found besides that. Sometimes, you stumble upon something else, some gruesome scene. And in such scenes, another aesthetic becomes abundantly clear. The narrative aesthetic. Such scenes could be easily left out, but they each tell a little story of their own. They are all part of the main story Half-Life tells. What is particularly interesting it's how Half-Life decided to tell its story. But before we take a closer look at that, let's take a look at a few ways that games can tell a story. Generally speaking, there are three ways that games can tell a story. 
one way to tell a story is actually by not telling anything at all. The narrative in the game is completely created by the players of the game. The emergent narrative can exist in pretty much every game. Any game you've played where you could tell your friends about what you've done or what happened to you has an emergent narrative. Some games even build their mechanics around this emergent narrative, like The Sims. A perfect example of emergent narrative is a game like DayZ. Pretty much every life you have in that game turns into an adventure of its own. If you've played the game, you know exactly what I mean. You probably still remember some of the incredible moments you had in a playthrough. Maybe you even told others about it. This is what we call an emergent story. A story that you yourself generated. An interactive narrative is one where the story is created by the player and the author together. The game can leave it up to the player where to lead the story or what to do with the events presented. This can simply be done by adding dialogue trees to the game, or by having branching storylines the player can follow, based on their actions. But the role the players take in the story can also be much more subtle. Think for instance of the infamous No Russian mission in Call of Duty. The circumstances indicate that the player should partake in these gruesome acts, and he is completely free to do so. But you can also choose not to shoot at all, and the game won't penalize you for that either. You can choose what role you'll take in this story, and the game leaves that choice completely up to you. This is an interactive story. But one of the most common ways to implement narrative is by simply showing it to the player. The story is shown exactly as the author intended it to be. It can be in the form of written text, audiobooks, or by showing cutscenes to the player. But this method of storytelling can also be a lot more subtle than that. For instance, another form of presentational storytelling is through the environment a player can walk through. The designers can choose to arrange objects in the level in a certain way to tell parts of the story. Half-Life loves to tell stories this way. You frequently come across scenes with some dead bodies and blood lying around. By the way these bodies are placed, you can deduce a bit about what happened before. The game is full of these little environmental stories which all add to the overall narrative aesthetic in Half-Life. The storytelling also happens in some of the dialogue you can overhear. Half-Life manages to tell its story mainly with its gameplay and environments. There are some predetermined events in the game, which you have to watch to progress through the game. But even then, you are never really stuck in a cutscene to watch them. Aside from these few events, the story is mainly told by the actions you take and the things you find. This is quite rare in the AAA industry today. Many games rely heavily on scripted events and cutscenes to tell their story, instead of telling it mainly through the actual gameplay, like Half-Life does. A very notable thing is how hard the designers of Half-Life try to keep you immersed. They try to make you feel like you're inside the world of Half-Life instead of sitting behind a monitor playing a game. This boundary between the game and reality is often called the magic circle. When a player is inside this magic circle, they generally accept the game as a temporary reality. The player will accept the rules and logic in the game instead of comparing it to reality. Inside the magic circle, 
you are more immersed into the game and you won't care if some of the video game's logic doesn't apply in the real world. It is very important to keep your players inside this magic circle for as long as possible. But that can be quite tricky, because breaking out of this magic circle is very easy. Here are just a few ways this can happen. Think for instance when something outright ridiculous happens in a game you're playing. Something so illogical and absurd that you just can't take the game seriously anymore. It can be in the form of awkward dialogue, ridiculous story twists, or overly exaggerated action sequences. Another quick way to break the magic circle is by encountering bugs or glitches in the game. In that instant, you realize you're still playing a game and that that game can break down at any time. Even in the most dramatic sequences of the game, if a glitch occurs, it will break immersion. The game stopping you from doing something is also a sure way to break the magic circle. The huge culprit in this area is the invisible wall. Countless games still use invisible walls to stop the player from exiting the level. It is especially immersion breaking when developers sloppily disguise invisible walls or when they have silly reasons for not letting you through. Half-Life is very careful about not breaking this magic circle. In the beginning of the game, you are completely free to move around in the labs. But this also means that you are not protected from harm. Think for instance of these elevator shafts. The developers could have easily put up some barrier here to keep the player from falling down. They could have protected the player from making stupid mistakes early on. But instead, they decided to leave it completely open. If players want to jump down and die, they can. The game isn't stopping them. But such freedom could make the game very confusing. Just imagine if we didn't have any barriers at all. You could at any point in the game walk all the way back to the beginning without anything to stop you. The game would turn into one gigantic maze and would become incredibly confusing and frustrating. So, let's look at a few ways Half-Life tries to put up such barriers without actually breaking the magic circle. This room is filled with large containers hanging from the ceiling. In order to progress, you have to jump between the containers to get to the other side. But these containers aren't hanging at the same height. They actually form some kind of stairs. This way, it's easy to go forward, but at the same time, it is impossible to go back. In this part, you have just defeated a pair of dangerous tentacle monsters. Only after you've destroyed these monsters, a new path is revealed. It's a gigantic hole you can jump into. Once again, jumping into this hole means that you will not be able to go back. This hole makes sure you go the right way and leads you to an entirely different area in Half-Life. This last example shows that putting up a barrier for the player doesn't have to take much. All the player does is crawl through this pipe. Once he reaches the end and drops down, it appears that the pipe he just went through is now too far up to reach. At this point, the player is blocked from going back. And once again, Half-Life put up a barrier for the player without the use of invisible walls. Half-Life has a large variety of weapons, enemies and abilities. But just carelessly throwing new, unfamiliar mechanics at the player isn't really a good idea. It might leave the player feeling lost, not knowing what to do. So Half-Life is very careful with introducing new mechanics to the player. One of the earliest examples is how they show you how to get health in the game. What you see here is a guard lying down on the ground on his last breaths. 
But what can you see him do? He reaches for this red box on the wall. Why would he do that? Could that have saved him? This scene does two important things. The first is drawing the player's attention to the health box on the wall. And the second is suggesting what it could be used for. After the guard died, you can use the box he was reaching for. And it turns out, it restores your health. There are more examples of mechanics being introduced this way. For instance, the portals that can teleport you. The first time you encounter them, you can see someone walking into the portal and disappearing, effectively showing you that these glowing balls are something to pay attention to. Then, as you go along, you get to a room where you can safely try out the portals to see how they work. Half-Life also introduces most enemies to you before you actually fight them. The first time you see a hat crab is in one of these glass containers. And the first time you see a hat crab zombie is when it is attacking somebody else. Many times, the first time you encounter an enemy, you can first safely observe it from a distance. Before you have to fight it, you can see what it can do and what you have to watch out for. This way, it never really feels unfair when they suddenly throw a new enemy your way. My favorite example is the part when you first get the crossbow weapon. It does many clever things to show everything you need to know. The first thing you see when you walk into this room is a scientist being eaten by some gigantic fish. And you know immediately that this pool is more dangerous than the other bodies of water you encountered. The room is designed in such a way that your attention is immediately drawn to the goal. This cage. You can roughly see the route you have to take to get there and in one instant you know everything you need to know. 1. Avoid the waters. 2. Go to that door. 3. Get to the cage. When you get to the cage, you don't get a free shot. Instead, the cage falls down into the water, forcing you to see the danger before you kill it. But at the same time, this cage protects you from the monster, so you can safely shoot it. When you get a bit further, you get to a part that looks sort of similar. Same rusty walkways, same goo on the ground, and the same water. Without ever specifically telling you, you immediately know what this means. Dangerous fish in the waters. And then, when you fall in, sure enough, there are fish. The same thing goes for a lot of weapons. A lot of time, the first time you get a new weapon, the designers give you a few obstacles which introduce you to the weapon's functions and show you how to use them. Look at the bag of explosives, for example. Soon after you got it, you get to an elevator. But at the top of this elevator, your path is blocked by explosives. Shooting it doesn't work, since that would kill you instantly. And you really can't get past them. So, what do you do? Well, it's simple. You have to cleverly use the new weapon you got recently. This part forces you to think of a new way to use the bag of explosives, which you can then use later on. They do a similar thing with the laser trip mines. Before you're given the weapon, you have encountered it many times before. Sometimes you had to try and avoid its laser, or other times you had to set it off manually to progress. By the time you're actually given the weapon, you know exactly how it works and you need no explanation anymore. Once Half-Life has introduced you to all the weapons and enemies, the game throws you into an alien world. Zen. In here, the game takes a completely different turn. Before, the aesthetics of narrative, discovery and challenge were nicely balanced. But in Zen, the designers shifted their focus more towards the challenge aesthetic. 
you are constantly bombarded with enemies and you don't really have to search for weapons and ammunition anymore. Zen constantly challenges you and it is basically one big endurance race towards the final boss. Where Half-Life was a nice blend between action and exploration before, the designers decided that Zen, as the final part of the game, should really push the player to his limits and that he should not have to look for ammunition and health in the process. I could go on for hours, but I have to keep the video short enough. What things did you notice in the design of Half-Life? Feel free to leave a comment below. I hope you found this interesting and that you've learned a bit more about the subtleties of the design in games. This episode, we've taken a dive into the mechanics of Half-Life 1. The next episode, we will be looking at the design behind the sequel, Half-Life 2. I hope to see you next time.